We are in uh, Mark. We are in Mark still. We're going to continue to be in Mark for the next several weeks. Uh, I think this is week 18, actually, on the book of Mark, and we're only in chapter 7. So, yeah, fancy that. Fancy that. Um, but Mark continues to give us a fresh word and a fresh insight into the life of Jesus and the disciples. I can't just move on from Mark because Mark is so rich. It's just so rich, and it's, it's giving us a, a new dynamic um, every Sunday. We see a different and new and refreshing take on our Lord, our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. We are in Mark chapter 7, and I'm not going to go to the scripture uh, just yet, but in Mark chapter 7, I want to give you a little bit of context. Um, Jesus and the disciples um, uh, are, are in the uh, are in and around Jerusalem, and the disciples are eating, and some, some Pharisees came up to them and saw that they weren't following the hand-washing customs, the hand-washing customs of, of the time, of the faith, of uh, the religion. And so because they saw the disciples eating without going through those hand-washing customs, they have some questions for Jesus. And these aren't so much questions uh, you'll gather from the, from the posture of the Pharisees the answer of Jesus. It's not so much a question, but an indictment. Okay, so sometimes we can ask questions. And the questions that we ask can come across as more of an indictment than it is a curiosity. What is amazing about Jesus is that he is the ultimate question asker. Do you want to get well is a, is an, is a beautiful question that Jesus asks. Uh, if you go through the Gospels, you see Jesus asking all sorts of questions like, why do you call me good? Do you want to get well? Uh, where, is your, um, uh, where is your accusers? He's asking these questions, and, and these questions that he asks aren't so much confrontational as much as they are curious. Jesus, although he is all-knowing, enters into proximity to people who are experiencing confusion, and he enters in with a posture of curiosity. And I love that even though Jesus is the world's one and only know-it-all, he doesn't come across as a know-it-all. And not too many of us really enjoy being in the company of know-it-alls because know-it-alls can be pretty arrogant. They can be pretty, um, you know, judgmental. They can be pretty demeaning. When you're a know-it-all, it's like, oh, you're a, you don't know anything. And let me show you how this goes and let me show you how this is. And I'm surprised you don't know the answer to that. And you can be, be pretty self-righteous. You can be puffed up as a know-it-all. Jesus was and is the ultimate know-it-all. But he comes with questions of curiosity. And there are Pharisees that he's in proximity to in this narrative that we see. And the Pharisees are asking questions, not as humble, curious servants of God's word or servants of his people or his temple, but they come across as know-it-alls. And the know-it-alls are condemning. The know-it-alls have a posture of confrontation and uh, conviction. And so here's where we are. We are in uh, Mark chapter 7. I'll give you a moment to get there. Mark chapter 7, and we will begin at verse 1 and go through verse 13. Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. It says this. It says, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered to him after they came from Jerusalem and saw that some of the disciples were eating their bread with unholy hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the other Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thereby holding firmly to the tradition of the elders. And when they come to, from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they completely cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received as traditions to firmly hold, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and copper pots. You will see that in Mark chapter 7, verse 3 through 4, that Mark puts this context in parentheses. The reason for that is Mark chiefly is writing to Gentile believers. He's not 
writing primarily to Jewish people. He is primarily writing to Gentiles who were not raised in the Jewish tradition. So he gives context in parentheses here and saying, hey, here's something you need to know about Pharisees and practicing Jews, that they don't eat unless they carefully wash their hands according tradition to tradition, and that they also, by tradition, firmly hold to washing cups and copper pots and tea kettles and their dishes and all those types of things. So he clarifies that for his audience. Uh, here is just a little headline for you and me. Uh, we are his audience. The, the majority of us in this room are his audience. Mark's writing to you, and he wants you to know that there are traditions that the Pharisees and scribes and practicing Jews hold firmly to, and it is the washing of hands and pots and pitchers and cups, and this is all the traditions that they follow. And they're firm on these. Then it says, and the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk in accordance with the tradition of the elders, but they eat their bread with unholy hands. And he said to them, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, <laughs> as it is written. Okay, so here's the thing. The, the, the Pharisees are coming at Jesus, all right? You ever have somebody come at you? They're coming at Jesus and they're saying, hey, why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders? Why do they not walk according to the traditions of what we've always done? Why are they eating with unholy hands? Now, there is a condemnation. There was a charge there that the Pharisees are bringing and saying, hey, your disciples are uh, defiling themselves they are tainting themselves. They are rendering themselves unclean because they're eating food without cleaning themselves ceremonially that has been established by the elders before us. We've always washed our hands before we ate. We've always washed the plates and the cups and all, and we've always made sure that they were blessed and consecrated and all the, and went through the proper rituals because we want to make sure what goes into our body we want to make sure what goes into our body does not render us unclean. So we wash our hands and we make sure our plates and our cups are clean and then we're able to eat and drink and God says, yes, it is blessed and you can take part and eat. You are, you are eating without being made, made, rendered unclean. And this is what Jesus says. He says, man, you, you're making some assumption that just because my followers aren't washing their hands according to your traditions, that they are now unacceptable, that they're unholy. You see that charge? It's like, it's like uh, if we go just to the text before Garland, just, just the one uh, just before this, verse 5. It says, they don't walk according to the tradition of the elders, but they eat their bread with impure hands. The word there for impure hands is unholy, unholy. So there's an assertion that they're making about the holiness of the people who are eating what God has given them to eat. And it's like, yo, you're unholy because you didn't wash your hands. Could you imagine somebody while you're sitting down to a plate of spaghetti and you forgot to wash your hands at the kitchen sink? And you should wash your hands, by the way. But, but you forgot to wash your hands. And then somebody doesn't just say, hey, that's, that's like not cleanliness. Like that's unhygienic. Like they're not saying that according to a physical sense but they're saying to you, you are unholy and God will not accept you unless you wash your hands before you eat spaghetti. Like before you eat that garlic bread, you better make sure that you wash your hands or you will be rendered unclean and unacceptable before God. That, that's wild. Could you imagine being judged like that? Could you imagine being in the, in the house of a, 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 like an uber religious person and they come and, and they go, hey, make sure you wash your hands because you don't want to defile yourself. You, you want to make sure that you're not rendered unclean. We, we, don't, we want, don't want anything to get in the way of you and your relationship with God. So make sure you wash your hands because God really cares about washing your hands before you eat spaghetti or garlic bread. Like, like what Christ did on the cross isn't sufficient enough to, co to cover your dirty hands from that fleshly sense. And not because there's sin on your hands, not because there's blood on your hands, not because there's sin in your heart, not because you have an impure heart, but because you touched a dirty doorknob and now you're sitting down to eat spaghetti, you are now considered unclean. God won't accept you. 
That's what's going on here. Like your disciples aren't washing their hands. So they must be unholy. They're defiling themselves. They are rendering themselves unclean. And so they come at Jesus with this question of tradition and religion. And they come at him and they don't ask necessarily out of curiosity, but out of condemnation and charge and judging. So they come at him with this posture and Jesus comes back at them. And he says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites. He just straight up and calls them out. He says, hey, you guys are hypocrites. The prophet Isaiah talked about you guys. And this is what the prophet Isaiah said. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and the one who speaks evil of father or mother is certainly to be put to death. But you say, if a person says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is giving to God, you no longer allow him to do anything for his father or his mother, thereby invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. What Jesus is saying here is like, hey, look, you have lost the whole point of faith. You you have lost the whole point of this walk because what has happened is you have added a bunch of traditions and laws and, and things that you have added to the scriptures and you've added these things and they're actually getting in the way of God's heart. What, what you're doing is you're saying, if somebody says to you, everything that I have belongs to God, you're holding them to that statement and that covenant, quote unquote, that they have made with their belongings. And if their father and their mother are over here saying we need help and they're in distress and they've come up on hard times, you're telling the people who have said, I'm dedicating all that I have to God. You're holding them to that commitment saying mom and dad are going to take care of themselves and you cannot use any of the means that you've dedicated to the temple, that you've dedicated to God to help them. And Jesus is like, dude, that's not what that's for. That, that, that's a tradition that you're following. Don't you know that, that God in his word, it says take care of the widow, take care of the orphan, take care of the destitute, take care of the homeless, like take care of my people. And the, and the religious leaders started putting much more emphasis on the practices and traditions of men than the commandments of God that say love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind and your neighbor as yourself. Well, if these traditions are getting in the way of me loving my neighbor, then what good are the traditions? This is hypocritical. You you guys are giving yourselves to be seen. That's why Jesus says when you pray, don't do so out in public. Don't, Don't be wailing at the top of your lungs and using many words to be seen by other people. When you give, do it in secret. Don't even let your right hand know what your left is doing or your left hand know what your right is doing. Like, don't do these things to be seen in front of people. The reason why the Pharisees felt like it was so important to make sure things were clean is because they wanted people to see that they were clean. They wanted to wash their hands in front of people. They wanted to make sure their copper pots and their, their you know, teacups and their plates were clean and cleansed in front of people. They wanted to be seen as a people who were clean and untouchable and righteous and presentable to God. That was why they were holding up the tradition. And Jesus said, you're uh, you're worshiping me with your lips. You're showing people that you adore me. You show people that that you love my word. You show people that, that you have followed the whole law and you're acceptable before God. But your heart is far from me. Why? Because you're not loving the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. You're losing the commandments of God. You're losing the teachings of Jesus. You're losing the relationship because you are so focused on the tradition of the elders that were added to the scriptures. The traditions of the elders, the traditions of your forefathers, you've held them so tightly that you forgot the commands of God. And the commands of God are simple. You know, like, Like in the Psalms where it says, what do you require of me except for a broken and contrite heart before you? 
Or, or where it says, um, this is what I require of you, to love mercy, act justly, and walk humbly with your God in my God. What are the things that are required of a person when it comes to being in a relationship with God? Well, James says that you uphold and maintain the royal law to love your, the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus teaches it through his narratives and through his parables. If we remember the Good Samaritan, like that Jewish man who was walking along the road and who fell into the hands of robbers and a Samaritan was coming down the same road the opposite way and saw that this Jewish man was was beaten and left for dead and stripped of his clothes and robbed of his money and the Samaritan stopped and cleaned up his wounds and put him on his donkey and took him to the inn and paid for his debt and did all of these things and and Jesus is showing the religious leader who is an ex expert in the law through this parable that the things that you would deem untouchable are the things that would get in the way of you being the neighbor, of you receiving the grace of God in your own life. Sometimes we get so fo focused on our religion and our traditions that we re rob ourselves of experiencing God's grace. And so if that Jewish man is, is, is lying dead in the middle of the road and he's so focused on the customs and traditions of men, there was no way that he would let that Samaritan man help him. There would be no chance. No, don't touch me. I don't want to be unclean. Don't touch me. You're, you're a half-breed. You're a mongrel Jew. You, uh, don't touch me. Uh, I, can't, I can't accept your help. We, you are a fallen people. You are far from God. Could you imagine a man dying in the middle of the road and saying, because all of these traditions say so, I have to reject your grace. And at the same token, on the other side, it would be those very same traditions and that very same religious religiosity that would not only rob the Jewish man of receiving the grace of God, but also being a conduit of it. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and says, where is your grace? Like, you are neglecting the commands of God for the traditions of men. You know, so, so much, so often, you know, we, we've got so many different denominations in the Christian faith. It's crazy. And, and key markers of those traditions and those denominations, or those, the key markers of those denominations are actually the traditions of men. It, it, a lot of times, the key markers of a denomination is what has been added to or a particular tradition that has to do with that particular denomination. And if you aren't taking part in the tradition of that denomination, then you just can't be a part of the denomination and you don't belong to the church. And so often we can be so caught up in the traditions of how we do things that we forget that we're supposed to just look our neighbor in the eye and tell them how much God loves them and tell them how much that you love them and show them what it looks like to be patient and kind and loving and long-suffering and, and joyful and hopeful and abounding in love and, and abounding in the spirit of God and abounding in his loving kindness. And, 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 and sometimes we can get so caught up in the this is how you do it that we completely forget what God has to say about his church and who we are meant to be. We can get so wrapped up in the tradition of of addition. That is, we have added our own principles, we have added our own narratives, we have added our own standards, that it has kept us from remembering the grace of God. Isn't that wild? And so if it's in the word, then it's in there and let it be there. But 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 sometimes we got to be careful that that we lift up things in our faith and in our life and we say that's the marker and that's the standard and that's important and it's not even in here it's not even it's like well show me where it says that show, show me where where you know the the prosperity gospel is evident and contextually accurate for me like if you give you're going to be freed of your cancer if you're if you give miraculously your car note's going to be paid if you take this holy water and you drink it, suddenly your, your, your skin is not going to have any sort of, uh, uh, what's that stuff, eczema anymore. Like you're going you're gonna to be cleared up. Your, your uh, poison ivy is going to go away. There, there are things, that if, if, if I wave this sheet across you, then you're going to be healed. 
or, or in a particular style of music. Like, just show me, like, in the word where it says, no, like, that, that style is acceptable. Acapella, just ver voices, no organ, no piano, no guitar, no drums. And that's acceptable before God. But over here, the electric guitar, the drum set, the choir, that is, un he detests that. There are some traditions that we, that we uplift. Like there are churches that refuse to have Easter services without an egg hunt. And I'm like, show me that in the Bible. Well, I won't go to your church. Do you have an egg hunt for my kids? And I'm like, where is that biblical? That, that, we, do, that we follow along with pagan practices that we've just allowed to like condition to our culture. And we just go along following the Easter bunny and, and the eggs and do the egg hunt. And that's cool, man. I don't, I don't think just because we're egg hunting, we're worshiping a false god. I don't think we're doing that because I, when I look at my kids like opening Hershey kisses inside of a colored egg, like I don't think they're saying like praise be to the Easter bunny like that's my god. I don't think they're doing that. It's It's fun. But there are people who say, no, I refuse to go to a church that doesn't have an Easter egg hunt. I refuse to go to a church that doesn't have this or doesn't have that. You don't have Christmas trees on stage during Christmas. It's like, dude, that's a tradition of man. Like, what are you talking about? Show me a Christmas tree in the Bible. Like, and I know actually in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it's like, beware the, the with, through pagan worship, there's trees that are decorated unto false gods. There's actually that. So maybe we have to actually come to terms with that as a people and say, all right, look, like, maybe that's not God. Maybe that's not Jesus. Maybe that's actually getting in the way. Your preference for worship, your preference for the house might be just a preference and be unbiblical, and it might be getting in the way of not only you experiencing the grace of God, but being a conduit of it. We can often get so wrapped up in traditions that we miss the heart of God, that we miss God's word. Here's the thing. Tradition doesn't always mean truth. Just because you've done it forever doesn't mean it's in line with God's heart. I think we have a slide on that. Tradition does not always mean truth. And <laughs> tradition does not always mean truth. And you have to cross-examine your tradition. Look, Jesus told the, the Pharisees, you hypocrites, you put a heavy yoke on God's people with your traditions, with the things that you constantly beat them over the head about, forcing them with their offerings. And he was so upset that he flipped the tables of the money changers in the temple. Like, traditions, that is not what God commanded. That's just what you decided. And so, often, we can mistake tradition for truth. Jesus comes and he says, you're a, a hypocrite. And what does that word hypocrite actually mean? It, it comes from the Greek word, and that word hypocrite actually means stage actor. Do you know that? That's where we get the word for stage actor, a hypocrite. Uh, I think it's Greek like hypocritus or, or something like that. I forgot uh, the, the actual word, but it actually means stage actor. It means you present yourself really well with the mask up on stage to be seen by people. But what you're doing is you're just putting on a persona that doesn't actually match up with who you were created to be, who you really are. So on the stage, you look holy. On the stage, you look righteous. On the stage, you're cleaning your hands and you're washing your hands. But underneath the mask, you're dead inside. You, on, on the stage, you look like somebody who's really following God who's really doing a good job, who's really keeping with all the traditions, your forefathers would love you. They'd say, good job. Way to keep with the, the, the cleansing ritual. Way, way to keep up with the standard. But, but behind the mask, God is looking at the depths of your heart and is saying, it's far from me. He said, you do a really good job honoring me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You're a stage actor. You're giving wonderful monologues. You're saying amazing prayers. But you're putting such a heavy yoke on the people that it is so evident that this is what the prophet Isaiah was saying to the people of Israel and saying, hey, you honor me with your lips. You keep up with the traditions. You keep up with the traditions of men. But your hearts are far from me. You care so much more about how you are seen in front of people when it comes to your relationship with me 
that you forgot what it means to love people out of your relationship with them. You are a hypocrite. You are a stage actor. You're clean on the outside, but you're empty on the inside. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, God was saying to Samuel that he needs to pick a anoint a new king for Israel. And, and that king was, was David. And David was the youngest of his brothers and he was a shepherd. And God clearly says to the prophet Isaiah, he says, don't look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Samuel was looking at all the brothers of David and he was trying to judge them according to their stature, their height, how good they looked, how elegant they were, like how handsome they were. And he was looking at them and he said, no, 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 I'm rejecting the ones that look like they have it all together. I'm rejecting the ones that, that are pleasing to the eye of the people around him. The, your first pick, I have rejected that one because I'm not looking on the exterior. I'm looking at the interior of a man. I'm looking at the soul of the man. I'm looking at the heart. And don't sell short based on what you see on the outside and mistake it for being in line with what's on the inside. They can be tall. They can be handsome. They can have the newest and freshest fit. They can be up with all the trends. They can be totally relevant. They can be in it, but their heart can be far from me. And so I'm looking at the one that you would reject, and I'm saying that's the one I'm choosing because he is a man after my own heart. And God anoints him, David, through Samuel, and David becomes king of Israel. And he becomes etched into the fabric of history and biblical history forever. And we're talking about him now because God looked in on the heart. See, God looks in on the heart, and we have to remember that when he says to the Pharisees, you're, you're worshiping and you're glorifying me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Here's the thing. It's easy to know what to say in front of people to sound righteous. It, it's really easy. How are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Blessed and highly favored. Hey, how you doing? Too blessed to be stressed. Uh, hey, how you doing? What's going on? Oh, you know, I'm just, I'm just loving God, man. Just loving God. Like, just loving God, man. Uh, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. We can praise him with our lips. But how many of us know that there are times when we praised him with our, our lips, but our hearts were far from him? Like we just got done sending up a storm and then in the next breath, we're like, he's so good. You know what I mean? Like, like I get the texts, I get the emails and the phone calls, you know, and, and it's like, okay, listen, it's easy to praise God with our lips. But if our hearts are far from him, then what really is the use? Like, what's the point? It's just hypocritical. And you know what the number one reason why most people decide that the church isn't for them is? It's full of hypocrites. And guess what? They're right. They're right. We are full. We are hypocritical. And then I'm like, okay, well, our whole society and our whole world is hypocritical. I, I see hypocritical examples all in and through our world. I'm not going to get into them because they tend to be extremely political. And I'm not here to get political. But I am here to point us to Jesus. To say, if we are living in that state of saying, God, you are everything. And God, you have my heart. But as soon as we get out of here, if we choose the things that are far from God's heart. As if he's not enough from us. Then we're stage actors. We're stage actors. In our culture, there are countless examples of people who were wonderful entertainers 
and terrible people. Just because you know how to put on the face and to say the lines doesn't mean that you're in line with God's heart or reflecting his face. So that's convicting to me. James says, I do not recommend or suggest that many of you become teachers because you will be held to a higher standard. I better be living this. I better be someone who is following God's heart, seeking him at his word, loving people well, and being sure that my heart is broken and contrite before him, before anything else, before anything else. Here's the last thing that I want to say um, about this, and then we'll close um, after a quick illustration because um, something surprising happened this morning, and, uh, and I want to and I want to take advantage of it. So, uh, the Pharisees were very put together and had on their priestly robes and their phylacteries, and they washed their hands and did all the cleansing ceremonies, and they often gave themselves to practices. And 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 look, I don't want to villainize the Pharisees. I don't want to do that because many of them. Like just, they're keeping to God's word. This is what we do. This is this is how we stay clean. This is how we present ourselves. This is how we're, you know, acceptable before God. And and I don't want to judge their hearts, and and I don't want to villainize them. But these Pharisees in particular, let's talk about these Pharisees in particular who were judging and who were like, they're unholy. Why are they eating with dirty hands? Okay, can we just talk about them? These Pharisees and Jesus looks in on their heart and says, "You're hypocrites. You're stage actors. You do everything to be um, seen before men." And everybody's like, wow, look how righteous they are, right? And then you keep these traditions so that regular followers, regular people can't touch it. They they need you to be the mediator. They need you to help them. They, They just can't come to God on their own. They need you. They need you to point out their faults. They need you to help them with the ceremonies. They need you to make their offerings acceptable. They need you. And that's like, yeah, see, like I'm God's spokesperson, right? So God says that in this word that Jesus quotes, it says in verse 7, it says, in vain they worship me. It is in vain that they worship me. And he's speaking of vanity here because basically Jesus is saying, and God was saying, you're doing all these things to be seen to put yourself on a pedestal and to make yourself come across as equal to God. And it's for your own vanity that you're doing so. You want to be popular. You want to be seen. You want to be a standard. And so you're placing yourself on the seat, on the same level as God, saying, this is what it looks like. Look at me. And Jesus says, in vain you are worshiping me and you're bringing these traditions and these commandments that are doctrines of men. Didn't ask you to do that. I didn't ask you to be that. One thing that I want us to keep in mind in line with this is in Exodus 20 verse 7 where um, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments for the Israelite people. It says in Exodus chapter 20 verse 7, you shall not take the name of of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. So when Jesus says in this word, in this prophetic scripture, you worship me in vain, he's referencing the 10 commandments. So he's saying in your tradition of vanity, you're breaking the commandment of God, right? In your tradition of cleansing and pointing out and washing, you're breaking the command of God. What is the command of God? Don't take my name in vain. And for us in our context and in our culture, we have been raised to believe that that just means don't say JC, don't say J, J, like GD, don't like, you know, drop something and be like, Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, or stub your toe and, ah, you know what I mean? Like, that, that's, hey, don't take God's name in vain. Or, or don't say, oh my God. Don't say, oh my God. Or because that's taking the Lord's name in vain. And you're right. Many of this, much of this context It means don't take the name, don't say the name of the Lord with emptiness. Don't don't say his name with emptiness. 
And that's saying it with emptiness. When you say, oh my God, or whatever, or we see people just say JC all the time in conversation. You're, you're taking his name, you're saying his name with emptiness. But do you know what this actually means according to Jewish tradition? This word here, do not take, is the word nasa in the Hebrew. Nasa, N-A-S-A with some marks above it um, for emphasis. Nasa, which is a derivative of the word nisi. And if we look at the word nisi, the word nisi means banner. And so when Abraham defeated the Amalekite army and God gave him victory, he said, the Lord is my banner. This is Jehovah Nisi. A banner is something that is raised up. It is a indicator of what army you fight for, what nation you belong to. My, the star-spangled banner, right? <laughs> it's a banner. This word Nasa means to lift up or to carry. So when, when, when the word, when God says in his command, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, he's saying, do not carry the banner of your God in vanity. Do not carry the banner. Do not nasa the nisi. Do not carry the banner. Do not take the name like a banner. When you stand at the altar with your significant other and the wife takes the name of the husband, he is saying, do not take that name in vanity. We are the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. We take his name. We are Christians, Christ followers. We take the name of the Lord as a banner, as a covering. And Jesus says, if you're taking that name in vanity, one, in emptiness, like it's no big deal, but two, in vanity, that is with pride to pump yourself up and put yourself on an even playing field with God and to be seen by others, you're doing it wrong. If you are acting unjustly, if you are acting by, uh, through prejudice, if you are acting and condemning, if you are acting in a way that is out of line with, God, with God's heart while trying to uh, accrue for yourself, like your own comfort, your own ideals, like your own things for yourself, if you do that, your heart is far from God. Do not take the Lord's name in vain for your own purpose. We've seen nations go to war under the banner of God. And out of vanity, they take on the banner of God, his name, and they decide to go to war, and we call them holy wars, right? Like slave owners in our country justified slavery by use of the word and being covered by God. And using the word out of context and justifying being cruel to their slaves and having slaves at all. God is saying, do not use this to justify your own immorality. Do not use this to justify your own selfish desires. Do not use this to pump yourself up or justify yourself. That is not what my name is for. My name is for you. Your banner is lifted up so that people can see my glory. So that they can experience my grace. So they can enter into this kingdom, not so that there can be a heavy burden, but so that they can experience the grace of God through you who has taken the Father's name in humility. Because the opposite of vanity is humility. Because vanity is pride. It's makeup. Vanity fair. You've read the magazine. What is it all about? You. Vanity. Vanity says, look at me and justifies it. Humility says, look at God. Vanity says, look at me. Humility says, look at God. So, listen, Pharisees, I know that you want to be focused on people seeing how clean you are through these traditions, how holy you are through these traditions. I know you want them to see you, but Jesus is standing right there and is telling them to eat because his grace, grace is sufficient for them to eat. And Jesus, as we'll read on through this because there's a part two next week, 
second half of this text because then he'll start talking to Gentiles, unbelievers, people who aren't Pharisees and Jews among them. And he'll start talking to them about the condition of their heart. What really defiles you? And he say, it's not about what goes in, but what comes out. As long as I'm here with you in your midst, you're clean. And you can eat what you want. Because my grace is sufficient to cover that which is being held up in vanity. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text. Um, we thank you that your grace is sufficient. You care for your people and you've removed all obstacles. There are no obstacles now that which get in the way of us communing and fellowshipping and eating and supping with you. Lord, we are your people. We are your children. And we praise you and we thank you that you've removed every obstacle, uh, every entrapment. And all you ask is for our heart to be yours. We praise you and we thank you that you made it possible by way of the cross. Your grace is sufficient for us. And so we praise you and we thank you once again for welcoming us into your family as dirty as we are, as messy as we are, as sinful as we are. You say you're mine. Lord, help us to boast in you. If we're going to boast in anything, help us to boast in Christ. Because we're weak, but you're strong. We're unrighteous, you're righteous. We're impure, you're pure. We're unholy, you're holy. And it's by way of what you did on that cross and in your resurrection that now there is therefore no condemnation. We stand justified purified, righteous, and holy before you. Because as sure as the sun will be eclipsed by the moon tomorrow or today or whenever, we have been eclipsed by your righteousness. We have been eclipsed by your image before the Father. And so when he sees us, he sees nothing less than you. Help us to be humble in that, Lord. Help us not to confuse the traditions of men for the commands of God. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand, final benediction, and we'll get out of here. I know we ran a little long today. God had a lot to say, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Isaiah 60, verse 1 is our family verse. And it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Rise City Church, His glory has risen upon you. And I know that there's a lot of things that we got to figure out and work out and allow the Holy Spirit to touch in our life. But know this now, he died for you to make you acceptable. So follow him, knowing that his grace is sufficient to cover anything and everything that you might deem untouchable by him. Be blessed this week as you shine in the glory of God and you reveal his grace to those who you touch this week. Amen? Amen. Have a wonderful week.